Hi, Dr. Doug Graham here for Let's Cook Raw, and I am just excited as I could be to be talking <laughs> with my dear friend I've known for almost 40 years, Aris <laughs> Latham, and my goodness gracious, don't you just look beautiful. Aris, welcome to the show. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, so much. It's quite an honor to share this moment with you, my brother. It's been a good some time now. <laughs> Oh, it has. I remember back in, back in um, Miami, Florida, in, in Coconut yeah. Grove, you used to oh, have yes. a little booth under a tree and sell raw food goodies, concentrated delights and wafers and all sorts oh, of yeah. wonders. And, sure. and you were the force in, in the whole South Miami area back then, like I was up in Atlanta back then. And yes. And, uh, <laughs> What a what a powerful thing! You're now now a worldwide force, and mm -hmm. and we just want to know a little bit more about you and what makes you tick, and 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 maybe tell <laughs> us a little about your early history. Um, did you have health problems? What kind of foods did you eat as a kid? Where were you raised? Nobody knows. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> yes, yeah. Well, you know, look, it it all started uh, around seventy three years ago when I was born in the Panama Canal Zone, you know, uh, in a wonderful neighborhood, in a tropical rainforest, you know, uh, and hanging out in grandma's kitchen and grandpa's chicken coop, you know, out in the farm, you know, right there. And just, you know, a, a little uh, wild kid, you know, in the bush, <laughs> you know, collecting oranges after the hurricane or whatever, you know, came through and uh, hanging out on the banks of the Panama Canal, fishing in the lake or, or in the sea, you know. And, you know, we talk in 1947. And of course, you know, <laughs> this is pre, you know, uh, modern convenience era. So we 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 we're cooking on the cold pot, you know, or 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 trying to 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 eat the food before the ice melt, you know. Right. So it, it's it's a legacy of freshness. That's what it was all about. Fresh. And back then, all food was organic too. Everything oh, was no, organic. It's no question. Wood. No question. Yeah. So going to the market with Granny and you know. Uh, helping her with the basket, you know, with the goodies and can't wait to get back home to get in the kitchen with her to grate the coconuts and <laughs> wash the dishes, you know, just just hanging out there and hanging out with grandpa in the chicken coop, chasing down the chicken, get the bucket and drop the bucket on it. And then grandpa would chop the, the head off. You know, I mean, this is like kid days, you know, so it was quite interesting, quite interesting. And, you know, fast forward 17 years later, <laughs> here I land in, in inner city, <laughs> you know, New York, wow. Bedford Stuyvesant, <laughs> you know, <laughs> going to, to high school, you know, the age of 17 and, you know, major contrast, you know, from the, from, from the, uh, the bush to the concrete jungle, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and getting into and those were some tough times in Bedford Stuyvesant. Oh, real, real times, real, real times. tough times. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, meeting Sloppy Joe and you know Scubanong and these other characters, you know, <laughs> spinning the bottle of wine and you know hanging out with the jitterbugs, you know, and you, you got to be careful you can't bop, you know, Panamanian style because they'll ask you to you know, jump up and let me hear if you, any coins jingle in your pocket, then if they, they hear anything, it's theirs, <laughs> you know? So you have to be, you know, but anyway, it, it, growing days, growing sure. days. And we you know, uh, 1967, I'm, I'm landing in, you know, community college, Bayside, New York, out in, out in the burbs, you know, uh, taking the, the subway and the bus, 
you know, to go to, to go to school, you know, to go to college every day, commuting, you know, from the inner city to, to, to the suburbs. And, uh, and lo and behold, you know, we're talking hippie era, you know, uh, anti-Vietnam War climate and, uh, and the Black Power movement. So it's like, uh, it's a whole nother, you know, school of hard knocks, <laughs> you know? But the knocks were soft, because we're talking, you know, back to the land, you know, love power, you know, uh, self-defense, yeah. the, the, the time of the revolution, you know, and fortunately it wasn't televised back then because we were doing some wild things, you know, <laughs> you know, we were doing some wild things. So, you know, so it's interesting uh, getting uh, introduced to, you know, vegetarianism back then, you know, and it wasn't about vegetarianism based on the fact that, you know, we were conscientious objectors, so we're not going to Vietnam to kill other people. We're not going to Vietnam because we don't want to fight in your rice war. <laughs> you know, we don't want to, you know, support uh, uh, people, you know, business folks to, to hog up the rice culture of the world, the rice basket of the world, or things of this, you know, simple nature. But as students that were hungry for knowledge, hungry for growth, you know, we, we're like, uh, you know, this food that we, we've been served in our cafeteria, it's a weapon. Because every time we eat this thing, we, we sneeze, we get drowsy, and something is not right. So we're, we need to, uh, like, really defend our lives. You know, the same way we were sitting in in the college campus, yes. Kent State yes. and these places, you know, and we don't want to go to war. We're not going to kill ourselves. We're not going to point that that wax apple into our mouth and shoot our brain with it and tie it up with, you know, these chemicals and all of these other types of stuff. So this is it. This was the impetus. So it wasn't about saving the bald eagle or the zebra or saving any animal before we saved the one that we slept in. Absolutely. So it was about human rights, self-defense, you know, and, uh, and it's been a magnificent journey ever since then. You know, so coupled with getting the, the hippie, you know, uh, culture in the suburb, in, in, in school, and going back home every day to, to Bed-Stuy, to the inner city, and uh, in, in the community, we had now independent black schools, you know, where people, we were being taught, you know, about our history, our culture, and things like this. But also, we had co-ops there. We had food co-ops, and I had my first vegetarian 101 class, you know, at this independent black school, being a volunteer at the co-op in 1968, <laughs> you know, and it, it's, it's all been, been history ever since then, and, and I'm still a part of the revolution. You know, what we do even up to today is still revolutionary, and uh, I'm so proud and, and honored, you know, to have grown up these past 50 years now, 50 plus years, you know, as part of this revolution and having subsequently been uh, acknowledged by the Oxford Encyclopedia of Food and Drink uh, as the father of ethical gourmet raw food cu cuisine Absolutely. for having spiced the cuisine. You know, because that was my current contribution. I spiced it, you know, because back then when we got into to raw food, it was it was like rabbit food. You literally had to be sick to, to, to eat it because it was designed for healing, for curing. You know, Dr. Ann Wigmore, bless her soul, you know, right. that really pioneered along with my beloved brother and great friend, Victoria Skolvinskas, you know. And these were the people that I will able to touch physically that I got the energy from. So I wasn't sick. I wasn't ill in any way. I was just a young college student that was just hungry for knowledge and, you know, got introduced to the whole vegetarian culture and then started eating up books. <laughs> you know, I think the first book I ate was Paul Bragg's, you know, Scientific yes. Fasting. Yes. And yes. that triggered it. Fasting once a week 
and I'm still eating, you know, my little garbage in the college campus, but hey, I'm under my trail mix, trying to be here, you know, and I'm going to the health food store to, to re-up my little trail mix, but I'm reading the books that I met, met up upon in the health food store, you know, uh, Professor Norman Walker, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> Professor uh, Hilton Hotema, you know. Exactly. Yes, Professor Arnold Herrett. So I, I amassed a library of over 12,000 self-help book, you know, by the time I was 30, you know, just gobbling up. And especially, I, I think I purchased all the raw food books that I could find yeah, as well. Readers are readers, man. Yeah, yeah. And you, so, you, so it's, it's, let, you know, you could have rested on your laurels 40 years ago and still be a famous man. But thank you for being a leader and staying out in front of the curve for all of these years and to still be doing it. Uh, your oh, energy, yes. your yes. energy is infectious in the best right. of possible ways. I'm curious, do you. you have, do you have any other memories of, of either incidents or people you met or things you could tell us from early raw history in your life? Oh man, I tell you, look, for me, the big highlight back then, uh, we're talking 19, 82, <laughs> you know, because uh, I did, you know, some some flips around the corners and did this, went back to, to school, went to graduate school, uh, Fuller, Cal State Fullerton, you know, studied linguistics, got a master's in linguistics and uh, bilingualism and working in bilingual education and so forth. But I retired, you know, at the age of 29, I retired. I'm like, no, I, I'm not going to do this anymore for the rest of my life. I can't be caught up in academics like this and dealing with languages, language arts, where people, you know, it's just like a, a requirement. They, it wasn't like anything fun and motivating. So anyway, I retired and I moved on, went and lived in uh, Tanzania up in the Kilimanjaro with the Maasai and watching them dr drink the, the cow's blood and slaughter the, their wow. herds of calves and you know and but yet looking out for me because i'm a fruitarian back then you know and i'm up there in the bush with all these meat eaters but they'll they'll bring me like you know the best avocado you know the best papaya so you know so i'm sitting down dining with these guys you know <laughs> and they're like really into their thing but there was a mutual respect you know of the sacredness of our food you know so it wasn't about, you know, no, you got to eat with us what we're eating, you know? Right. So that like really was a big eye opener. So then I moved back to the U.S., you know, uh, 1979, landed in Harlem, New York, and, uh, and I started an organic fruit co-op to get my, my goods. So I had stuff coming out of Florida. There was a company in Florida called Organic Conspiracy. I remember them quite well. So I would get my cases of, you know, oranges and mangoes and all the tropical stuff coming out of Florida. Then I had stuff coming from California from Sunburst Farm. The hippie farms up up in, in in Santa Barbara, you know. So I'm getting all of my stuff, and but I'm in Harlem, you know, no man's territory, you know, back then, you know, junkie on the corner. I mean, literally, you know. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, but funny. but you know, so my co-op, you know, my community wasn't cooperating with the co-op. So I decided, like, well, for me to survive and not have to go back into the the workforce, you know. I'm going to uh, get me a little shop. So I bought an herb shop, you know, Savannah Herb, you know, in Harlem. Folks, they want their herbs. So they come in there for their herbs. And, uh, and I have my juices and I have my organic fruits that they don't see these kind of fruits, you know, in the inner city community, you know. Oh. And then I had my salads and my sun burgers and my paradise pies ready to go. So there, you know, th they came upon these things and they started enjoying it and really, you know, supporting, you know, my efforts. Then there was like, uh, how did you make this? And why are you only eating raw foods? So that triggered the opening of my institute, you know, the uh, what I call the house of life, you know, where we 
just took an abandoned brownstone, <laughs> you know, and uh, did sweat equity with the government because, you know, nobody wanted to live in Harlem. So, you know, so a brownstone that eventually sold for a couple of million dollars. We were paying a dollar a month to oh. occupy this thing, to homestead, literally, doing sweat equity. And, uh, but 1972, the whole life expo comes to New York, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, a big national health expo. And, uh, and we got a booth to sell sun fired foods. And, you know, there was Govinda's, you know, all of the, right. you know, local natural food eateries, you know, that were in there. And, uh, and Dick Gregory was one of the headliners, you know, my great, you know, became my great mentor eventually. Greg Gregory, who, you know, did a lot of work with Victoria Skulvinskas, you know, uh, this is a man that was 300 pounds that, you know, uh, his mentor, Dr. Alvinia Fulton out of Chicago, got a hold of him, put the man in a fast, turned him into a fruitarian, and he dropped down to 98 pounds. Right, that's from, where I met him. Yeah, running from LA to Washington, D.C., you know, jogging. <laughs> 3,000 miles on a fruitarian diet, fasting, and knocking off a good 200 pounds off of his body and became, you know, a really wonderful living inspiration for many of us, you know, in the inner city. So anyway, Dick Gregory hung out at my booth that weekend at the expo and started bringing all the big celebrities there that were into the, the whole culture, you know? And that's when it's like my, 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 the flame of fame lit up, <laughs> you know? Cause I'm like, I made all this money. We kept selling out constantly, but we're making our food in the booth as opposed to the other vendors. They got to go to their kitchen to cook and we're turning out sun fired foods, living foods in the booth, 10 by 10, you know? And uh, so lots of write-ups and everything. And then I was told like, hey, this expo, we're gonna have five of them next year. One in DC, one in you know Pasadena, one in San Francisco. And, and I hit the road, sold my little operation in Harlem, <laughs> you know, the Institute and the, uh, the, the herb shop, you know, passed it on to a buddy and we hit the, the travel circuit for five years, traveling around, doing all the major health expos, not only the whole life expo, but the time of your life expo, these are the senior citizens, the baby expo in the Santa Monica Convention Center, and you know, Jack LaLanne and all these guys, you know, doing their thing. And we're like, you know, the caterers of these events, like the Sun Fired crew. But the big highlight came uh, at a whole life expo in Pasadena when Shirley MacLaine, mm -hmm. the woman that was doing the channeling, she was written up all over the, in all the medias during that time. So she was the headliner of this expo, the whole life expo in Pasadena. And uh, we got there that Friday and the lines were around the block of the convention center. And pretty much, it's like the, the, the crowd that they expected over the weekend, they all showed up that first day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and all the food vendors, all the food we had planned on selling for the whole weekend, we sold it all in the first day. <laughs> so everybody is scrambling, trying to figure out how to invent food <laughs> the next two days, you know? But the Sun Fired crew will go to the 24 hour supermarket or to the wholesale terminal market at night do our shopping and land in that booth the next morning and fix our food right there, <laughs> you know? And we had lines two, three hours deep waiting for sun-fired foods, our Kush Tabuli, you know, to, 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 to come forward, our Paradise Five, the Green High. So to me, that, was, that has been up to today one of the most memorable highlights of my entire life of, you know, being a raw foodist and serving, you know, our community, you know, health on a platter, you know, health on <laughs> yeah, a platter. that whole life expo. <laughs> That's phenomenal. So you've come around full circle probably half a dozen times on this question, but 
Are there any specific nutrients that you pay attention to? Do you do nutrition by the food? Do you do nutrition by the nutrient? Is there certain <laughs> things that, you know, you say we really need to pay attention to? Well, you know, I, I do nutrition by, uh, by intuition, by my, my gut feeling, literally, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. how my gut feel after I consume that and just constantly just keep observing you know, keep observing not only the, the, the taste factor, you know, but the digestive factor. So many things that just came to light, you know, just intuitively, and then reading about it in the books, you know, it's like, okay, this, this really validates it for me, you know, on many level. But over the years, now I have observed what I call the electromagnetic energies of plant foods, you know, so for 50 years now of only consuming foods from the plant kingdom, no animal food consumption or anything like that, and 44 years of only consuming uh, sun-fired foods, all living foods, I have observed that my body has been the best barometer as to my nutritional intake, you know, Gradually, over the years, it has totally refined its intake automatically, and there's like certain, basically what I've noticed is that as the body grows cleaner, <laughs> you know, the most objectionable thing on the plate gets, you know, I lose the desire for it, <laughs> you know. And so even like today, right now, where I'm at, you know, I've noticed that you know, salt is a complete no, no, no. It's like, I cannot stand the taste of salt in my mouth anymore, <laughs> you know? So salt is a complete no, no. Even like now, even acid tasting foods, acid lemons and all of these things, you know, if I'm going to take pineapple, I juice it and I drink the pineapple juice. But for me to actually chomp down on a, on a slice of pineapple, no more. <laughs> No more at all, you know. So, and minimal fat, minimal fat, like now, even like say, like oils. I'm not into the, the coconut oil, you know, raw, extra virgin, cold press, organic. No, not even that for me. It's got to be fresh. So, I would get my mature coconut, husk it out, and run that coconut meat through my juice extractor, and I get fresh coconut cream Absolutely. which is really fresh coconut oil <laughs> you know the juice of the coconut meat the fat the rich direct fat from the coconut so this is me this is me now so and i notice also now it's like the the more mature my body has become the less food i need the less you know processing it needs to do so I've grown to a point where I, over the past seven years now, I've started, instituted another level of fasting because, you know, starting off with Paul Bragg's scientific fasting in, in, you know, in 1979, 51 years of fasting once a week, pretty much religiously or spiritually, you know, 36 hour fast, starting back then with distilled water because that was the consciousness of the day to moving on to coconut water, you know, and doing my fruit juices in the morning. Now I'm, I do like a quart of fruit juice with a quart of coconut water in the a.m. from 6 a.m. to 12 noon. And then from 12 noon to 6 p.m., I do a quart of coconut water and a quart of vegetable juice. You know, so I'm still getting my gallon in, but I'm a little bit more careful and a little more conscious of not just putting in just blank water, empty water, distilled water. You know, I'm putting in distilled water that the minerals really necessarily weren't removed, but they were reorganized, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and that coconut water, the fruit juices, the vegetable juices, it's like I get to really absorb. My body focuses on absorption rather than digestion and breaking down and then restructuring inside of my body, you know? So it's like direct structural, structured foods. Without well, I just had this conversation with a man trying to sell me a Kangen machine. 
Oh, and, my and I explained goodness. to him that when you put the food in your mouth, it restructures automatically as soon as it hits your mouth. That's and, right. And you don't have to structure your water when you put it in your mouth. It's going to structure appropriately. Yes, so good, yes. Good for you. Listen, oh, yeah. you know, you've been such a force for good in the world. You've influenced, I can't even guess how many people. Um, and you did a little bit of name dropping, but who else? Who were your early influences and who influences you today? Oh, man, look. One of my earlier influences, and still one of my greatest influencer today, you know, this just came in the mail. Yes. Man's higher consciousness. Yeah. Hilton Hotema. Absolutely. He's Hilton phenomenal. Hotema. Oh yes. Find his books. I think he wrote close to a hundred of them. Anyone you come upon is a gem. You know, this is a man that I think a good at least 40 years as a fruitarian, 50 years, you know, all living foods, uh, a man that, that lived close to a century in robust health, a man that has studied many sciences and arts and man that has actually even claimed to have astral travel <laughs> and, and lived on a, on a higher plane, you know, on a higher consciousness reading the Akashic record and dropping gems, dropping information. But the thing that resonated the most to me is in one of his books when he talks about Threpsology, this whole art of cooking, you know, the fatal process, you know, and how we destroy. So yes, one of my true, you know, teachers up to today, you know, any of his books I get a hold of, I, I, I read them out before I do anything else, you know. And, you know, of course, it's good to get them digitally also right now. They, they are available. But put look look him up, Hilton, H-I-L-T-O-N, Hotema, H-O-T-E-M-A. Uh, yeah, but, you know, I mean, I read all of Fraterian guys back then because that was my calling for Johnny me. Johnny Love Fraterian. Wisdom and all of yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was my calling, you know, for, because I grew up in a fruit jungle. You know, that was our main food as, a, as kids, sure. you know. So when I got into all raw foods, my first two years, I was a fruitarian completely. But when I started Sunfired Foods, the culinary business now, then I started eating prepared foods, you know, but it's been a blessing because I've been able to go through all of the different layers, you know, of, of, of raw foodism, you know, and really come back today. I am probably, I would say a good solid 70% fruitarian. And when I say fruitarian, I really want to qualify that, that we're talking about botanical fruits, not just uh, nutritional fruits that are sugar dense. You know, we're talking about cucumbers and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, eggplants and all of these fruits that have no sugar as well. A complete balance, you know, but also the system that I've observed, which I call, again, the electromagnetic energies of food, you know, which is something I've been living with for, for many years now, that, you know, the higher the moisture in the food, and the higher it grows, the more electrical energy or electrolytes mm -hmm. you're going to find in these foods. Yes, with exceptions of something like watermelon that grows on a vine. You know, I mean, for me, the watermelon vine, it's a spring. You know, it's, it's like a hose that's connected to the earth, that's pumping water out of the earth, you know, restructuring it filling it up with all this alkaline energy, all of these electrolytes, and packaging it in this 30, 40, 50 pound melon jar, <laughs> you know, yes. well packaged. And the same thing with the coconut tree. The coconut tree, the highest grown food tree on the planet, and we know as it is above, so it is below. The roots, you know, if the, the top is 100 feet above the earth, the roots are 100 feet down into the earth. And these are, these are like, you know, pumps that are pulling water out of the earth through the grace of the sun and the magnetic, the gravitational pull of the earth that's got them anchored in Pachamama, you know, in Mother Earth, you know. 
and and here you got this masculine energy, this male energy, this phallic or obelisk of a tree that just keeps growing up, you know, single, you know, stature, and uh, and pumping this water and alkalinizing it, turning inorganic minerals from the sea into an organic form and packaging it in these breast-like containers, you know, these coconuts, you know, and here's this masculine energy bearing 300 breasts, ready to feed the, the world, ready to hydrate the world. Look, Coconut Grove, where we met, you know, in Florida, it was a coconut tree forest. It was. That's what? why they call it Coconut Grove. And the entire Florida coastline, the entire Caribbean islands, the entire Pacific islands, the entire tropical belt of the world was a coconut water plantation. Right. You know, ready to hydrate the world. So for me, a good 40 years now, I don't consume water as we know it. I don't drink water from wells, from springs, from bottles, recycled toilet water that are filtered and packaged, you know, in our modern plastic cups and all of this stuff. No, my water comes from a tree. My water comes from plants. You know, not only coconut water, but watermelon. It's water. We're speaking the Absolutely. Queen's language. It's water. Watercress is water. Water apple is water. Orange juice is orange flavored organic water. I mean, Cucumber even the banana is more than 90% water by weight. <laughs> You know, no. I, mean, I agree with you completely. I love banana flavored water. <laughs> Please. Oh, yes. So, so who needs to drink blank water while we can eat fresh water that hydrates, electrify the system, charge it up, and we don't have to work for it. We don't have to expend all of the no brainer in it. Please, you know. So yeah, so this has been me, you know, for solid years now. And then also expanding on my fasting from my weekly fast and adding a lunar fast, you know, twice a month on the new moon and full moon. I'm shutting my system down. My digestive system, only liquids, only fresh juices are going through there. And then to that, I added my, my uh, you know, my, my, a seasonal fast on the solstice and the equinox, fasting three days, four times a year, shutting it down, allow the body to do its deep cleansing automatically. And then seven years ago, incorporating my annual fast event of the year, my life fast, fasting for the, the number of days, for the number of years I've been living on the planet. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> So July 27th, I just completed my 73-day annual fast. Or I call it juice feast these days because, you know, the word fast, I mean, fasting, the classical definition of fasting, it means to hold fast. Nothing goes past your lips, not even juice, water, or anything. Right. You know, as, as the ancient ones used to say, they fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. <laughs> Because we automatically fast every night, every time we go to bed. That's a built-in safety valve. Otherwise, we would have destroyed ourselves eating 24 hours a day already, long time ago. <laughs> you know? so, so incorporating a daily fast along with that nightly fast, that weekly fast, that lunar fast, that seasonal fast, and doing it for 73 days and breaking it right after my birthday, you know, it's been amazing. And I see how my body just renews itself and recalibrates and restructure every year from these fasts, you know. So then, yeah, so now it's like, I mean, there was one olive that I was left with, you know, because I had to get rid of olives, you know, you know, all olives are salty, you know. So I was only doing the, the dried, oil-cured olive, you know, that kind of stuff, you know. So after this fast, it's like not even that now. Not even that. Onions and garlic, not even that. My body don't need onion and garlic anymore. These are disinfectants. Right. I got nothing to disinfect, <laughs> you know? So over the years, just gradually, whether it's been the mushroom, the kombucha, all of these things, I've left them behind. My body don't need this type of harsh treatment 
anymore. <laughs> you know, my body don't need to be challenging. So it's on pretty much smooth sailing automatically. So at 73, 2020 vision, you know, no sickness, no anything, nothing ails me, nothing like that. When I look at my medical report, everything is in balance. Of fantastic. course. Just fantastic. The B12 is off. Okay, so yeah, I got a B12 deficiency. So okay, Harvard University Medical School explained to me why I have a B12 deficiency and I do not show the symptoms of that are commonly associated with B12 deficiency. Double digit? My double digit is or just low triple digit? Excuse me? Like when you, a lot of people tell me they have deficiency. Yes. Uh, but they don't have any symptoms. Right. <laughs> Which, well, I want to hear what you say first. Well, you know, my brain is juicy. I got plenty of oxygen on my brain for a 73 year old person. My brain is not shrinking. You right. know, and I'm getting wiser and cle clearer, you know, the gems are coming swifter at this age. So to me, it's, it's I, I feel that I'm really, uh, you know, living the way I've been living is that my body is really growing stronger, you know, but then also if yes, my nerves are steady, no issue with my nerves, no issue at all that are typically associated. So what I have observed during the years and doing my research, you know, checking the early works of Dr. Gabriel Cousin, where he specifically had cited, you know, the fact that we do not need uh, all of that heavy load of B12 you know, because 95% of it is excreted in our waste that we eat from, we derive from these heavy animal products. But of course, his science has migrated as well over the years, but I've kind of stuck to it because I've stuck to 100% living foods for 44 years, no trying, you know, some, some quinoa that's just lightly steamed, none of those types of things and no starches in my, in my eating program, no complicated carbohydrates that my body needs to break down into sugar. So that means no deep roots, you know, no roots that are not juiceable. <laughs> you know, if this guy doesn't have enough water, I'm not dealing with that because that's a complicated carbohydrate. Exactly. And I'm not gonna try to turn my body into a refinery to make sugar from yams at all. No beans not even sprouted mung beans or any of these things, even sprouted lentils, because the protein that we, that, that we love in the lentils, once you sprout it, based on the analysis that's been done by Viktora Skolvinskas in the book, Sprouts for Everybody, the protein count goes down because you're diluting it with this water. So, so what am I, why am I taking these things? Why am I, so anyway, so no starch, you know, and uh, very minimal fat, just whole fatty foods, you know, avocados for the most part and coconut. That's where most of my fat is derived from. And whatever seeds and nuts that I can comfortably digest today after taking them through the process of hydration and activation and even processing them and turning them into milk and cheese and yogurt and culturing them and all of these types of things. But still, I keep those things down to a minimum. So what I find or what I feel intuitively is that my body's ability with a clean intestinal system to, to, to generate the 5% B12 that is usually retained in the body of the animal flesh eaters, my body is capable of generating that, uh, naturally synthesizing it in my intestinal system. I hang out in the sun. I live in the sun. Just up to yesterday, I'm, I'm, I'm on the beach running my six miles. I'm biking two hours a day. <laughs> you know, I'm swimming an hour a day. You know, and I'm laid out in, in the grass, you know, just like the cows, you know, in the sun. But I got my green juice, you know. So that photosynthesis process, I'm generating what I need. So I'm a proud B12 deficient, sir. <laughs> you know, I'm happy to be B12 deficient, you know. So, so for me, this is the way I live. This is where I activate my life based on my real energy. And yes, certain things, I observe certain scientific information. I try to live by them as closely as possible. But 
my body speaks to me very loud and clear. And then when I look at my medical results and I look at the state of my health compared to, to other men in my age bracket, I, I feel pretty safe. You know, I'm on the right track. <laughs> oh, you are so right on the right track, man. You are on the main main line. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. Um, I could talk to you all day long, and it's a treat. <laughs> and I look forward to the chance to do that some more. Um, yes. And next time that our paths cross, you know, we'll make a point to spend more time together. It's it's exceptional yes. spending time with you, letting you go on your wavelength, and hearing how you think is it's a thing of beauty. It's it's so safe and so productive and so beneficial for people to hear your voice. And I just I just want to thank you for spending time with us. I look forward to having you come on. Let's cook raw and sharing mm -hmm. so much of yourself. And yes. All yes. I can do, Aris, is say thank you. Um, I have. I I hope maybe we can get a second interview because I have a bunch more questions to ask. <laughs> but I gotta ask you. You know, I I when I saw your pies, I'd never <laughs> seen anything like that. I'd never imagined anything like that. Uh, hopefully, at least for Let's Cook Raw, maybe you can bring a, a photo or two from some of those magnificent pies. I remember you had your store in Brooklyn. Or, oh, yeah. Right? It was in Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah right. On, on Flatbush Avenue in Park yeah. Slope. And yes. I used to send everybody to go get your pies. Even people, people had your birthday pies. They were using them for birthday pies out in Cleveland, Ohio. They were taking your pies were going <laughs> everywhere. Oh, and, yes. Yeah. Well, you know, when I had my place, I had my place in West Hollywood on Restaurant Row right there on La Cienega Boulevard. And the name of that one was Paradise Pie. Right. So people Paradise would go to Benny Anna's and eat their, their stuff. And they would, I was the dessert stop on <laughs> Restaurant Row. Well, West I understand Hollywood. why, because those pies were just, those pies. I remember <laughs> when I first saw them back in Hippocrates Institute that time. <laughs> When, it, when all the speakers got together. Um, and that's where I met Dick Gregory too. And, um, <laughs> and your pies have just been, you know, I remember seeing them on Coconut Grove and they were, it was just a, not only just so, so delicious, but so beautiful. The artistry, like I'm thinking, oh, okay. this man? he's an artist who happens to use food for his craft. Like that's his oh yes, movie. edible art. <laughs> it was so edible fantastic, art. and I just want to thank you for opening up so many eyes uh, mm -hmm. to the to the potential of living food and and eating fresh fruits and vegetables. Thank you again. You're welcome. It's 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 my pleasure. You know, the more I share, the more I grow, the more I learn. So I'm looking forward to sharing with. Let's cook raw. Let's fantastic. get in the See kitchen together. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you for. Okay, so oh, now I don't know what's happening. <laughs> ah. <laughs> now, now I'm not sure if we are or are not. Pause recording. I, I think. Well, it says recording, but there's a light that's flashing with a red yeah. something uh, on, on, on the, the icon that's flashing on the recording. Aris, you're beautiful. <laughs> Thank beautiful. you, my brother. I'm so glad you're down in Grand Cayman having a good time. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> and wherever you are, I'm sure the show will be a success from wherever you do it. The, you know, definitely we're both planetary citizens and uh, I'm comfortable on Earth. But, uh, oh, yes. Yes, but yeah, yes. being in a tropical location, it just sounds like you're living the life. And I'm so proud of you for it. Oh, yes. Well, it's, it's been a blessing to be guided, you know, to these shores at this time. And, uh, you know, I'm thankful. I'm, I'm honored and I'm, I'm blessed, you know, to have the breath, you know, and, uh, you know, my love, my prayers to everyone whose life has been interrupted or upended oh. by, you know, this, this, this world drama. But, you know, it's absolutely for the better you know we are going to be a better race you know after all it is so agree you know it's a growth opportunity for sure oh yes oh yes okay my friend i'll talk to you soon all right all right doug thank you doc bless <laughs>